Good afternoon. My article uh, over the weekend was titled The Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Eliud Kipchoge, The World Bank's Africa Pulse Report, Ecclesiastes and Ozymandias. Two important events happened last week. The Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed Ali, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for 2019 by the Norwegian Nobel Committee, and indeed it was a well-deserved award. In July 2018, I wrote, these 90 or so days represent the most consequential arrival of an African politician on the African stage since Mandela walked out of prison, blinking in the sunlight and constructed his rainbow nation. And whilst he faces a fiendishly, fiendishly complicated task holding uh, the country together, the Prime Minister, who has a singular self-belief in his destiny, is a virilian figure and a 21st century African leader, which is a scarce commodity. Whoever controls the territory possesses it. Possession of territory is not primarily about laws and contracts, but first and foremost, a matter of movement and circulation. And I think Abby has worked on that Virilio calls it dromology, it's the speed with which he has moved, which has changed the landscape. Staying with the theme of speed, our very own philosopher runner Eliud Kipchoge claimed the first sub-two-hour marathon with a time of one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. Mr. Kipchoge has said, I don't know where the limits are, but I would like to go there. Eliud went to Vienna to run his race and under the auspices of the INEOS challenge, which is a message of its own, but is not the subject of this article. Both these feel-good events were iconic and totemic. Staying with the theme of speed and the pulse, the World Bank released its Africa Pulse Report number 20, which gives us deep dive insights into the pulse of this vast continent of ours. And below are some bullet points. Regional growth is projected to rise to 2.6% in 2019, 0.2 percentage points lower than the April forecast um, in, uh, if, than the April for, forecast and this is a 0.1 percent increase versus 2018. The recovery in Nigeria, South Africa and Angola, the region's three largest economies, has remained fragile. In Nigeria, real GDP growth decelerated from 2.1% year over year in the first quarter of 2019 to 1.9% in quarter two. South Africa, for the entire first half of the year, real GDP amounted to 0.4%. In Angola, the region's second largest oil exporter, GDP contracted by 0.4% year-on-year in the first quarter. Debt vulnerabilities remain high. The share of countries in sub-Saharan Africa assessed in debt distress or at high risk of external debt distress has almost doubled, though the pace of deterioration has slowed. The median government debt to GDP ratio is expected to stabilize at around 55% in 2019, following sustained and broad-based increases since 2013. For the region as a whole, the average interest payments to revenue ratio is expected to rise to 11% in 2019 from 6% in 2012. Per capita GDP growth of the region as a whole has remained relatively flat, 
with no gain expected in 2019. Per capita GDP growth is projected at 0.5% in 2020 and 0.6% in 2021, well below the growth needed to improve the living standards of the region's population. The downward forecast revision for 2019 mostly reflects temporary drags from stressed economies including Mozambique, Sudan, Zimbabwe, but slowdowns are also seen in Kenya due to sluggish agricultural exports. Africa's total fertility rate of 4.8 births per woman remains high and even higher for poor women. Charlie Robertson, who is the chief economist of Renaissance Capital, has pronounced that South Africa is heading for a junk downgrade. A meme flying around on social media is that there is a new sex position called the Ramaphosa, get on top and do nothing. You will agree that the overall picture is not very pretty. The canary in the coal mine is Zambia. Investors have lost faith in government promises to get spending under control and the government has fallen out with the IMF as well, Charlie said. In Zambia, euro bonds are trading at 60 cents in the dollar. Even the Chinese, who many thought was Santa Claus, have thrown in the towel. I recall FOCAD 2018 and the famous photograph where all the Chinese officials had a pen and paper and not one African official was taking notes. Had they been taking notes, they would have heard Xi Jinping specifically speak of the end of vanity, which I characterized at the time as a substantive linguistic recasting of China-Africa by Xi Jinping. I only recently discovered Ecclesiastes, and clearly Xi was ahead of me in this regard. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. It seems to me that we're at a pivot moment and we can keep regurgitating the same old mantras like a stuck record and if we do that, this turns Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. We learn that the US is to deploy additional troops to Saudi Arabia. The Pentagon will deploy more troops and weapons to Saudi Arabia in an effort to deter Iranian aggression in the Middle East, according to Mark Esper, the US Defense Secretary. Esper said the US would send two fighter squadrons, two Patriot surface to air missile systems, and an anti ballistic missile defense system, along with extra troops, in the latest phase of the response to the alleged Iranian attack on Saudi oil facilities last month. I agree with uh, T Commodity, who produced this chart uh, on weekend. WTI poised to test $56.57 resistance area. We're currently at $54.10. Anas al Haji, who I follow on social media, oh my God, Sabiti, even the Iranians did not tell the whole story in the pictures they published. These were the events that happened on Friday when an Iranian on the tanker was hit. Um, let me now jump to Taleb, and this was something I quoted last week, but I'll quote it again. The market is like a large movie theater with a small door, and the best way to detect a sucker is to see if, if his focus is on the size of the theater rather than that of the door. 
Remember the ex-parabolic Austrian 100-year bond which topped a price of 200 at one point? And that's when I was saying that the market was a wizard of Oz world and eventually it is revealed that Oz is actually none of these things but rather an ordinary con man from Omaha, Nebraska who has been using elaborate magic tricks and props. 13th of August I was writing about how the renminbi is the most important currency to watch right now. A tea commodity again, the most watched chart of the world is the renminbi and we've seen quite a sharp rebound in that. 706.30, let's see whether we can push on from here. I rather doubt it. The market here, the renminbi matters more and more and this is the correlation. Uh, between the renminbi and specifically emerging markets. Home thoughts, a beautiful reminder on how connected we are by installing seesaws up the border walls so that kids in the US and Mexico could play together. It was designed by the architect Ronald Ryle. What happens on one side impacts the other. That took me to the swing by Kabir between the poles of the conscious and the unconscious, there has the mind made a swing. There on hang all beings and all worlds, and that swing never ceases its sway. Millions of beings are there, the sun and the moon in their courses are there. Millions of ages pass and the swing goes on, all swing, the sky and the earth and the air and the water. Makes me remember my mother, I think of her as being on a swing in my mind. Congratulations, Eliud, uh, 1 hour 59 and 40 seconds. This is the INEOS challenge, No Human is Limited. There's a link to the Mind Speech session we host, where we hosted Eliud, and he really is a philosopher runner. And what struck me most of all was a comment he made. He said, you know, Ali Khan, I've won the race before I've started. And I thought to myself, that's powerful, isn't it? To be in such a position. I don't know where the limits are, but I would like to go there. And he certainly did this weekend. This is Batian Peak, Mount Kenya, looks so inviting. That's from ACAMS. I was reading some Leopold Cedar Senghor, The Elegy of Midnight Summer, Splendid Summer, Nourishing the Poet on the Milk of Your Light. I, who grew up like the wheat of spring, which made me drunk from green water, from the green steaming in the gold of time, ah, no longer can I tolerate the midnight light. The splendor of such honors resembles a Sahara, an in immense void with neither erg nor rocky plateau, with no grass, no twinkling eye, no beating heart. Um, a sudden gust of simoom filling my throat with sand. Ah, if I could just collapse in the dung and blood and the void, I turn around among my books, watching me with their deep eyes. Six thousand lamps burning twenty-four hours a day. I stand up lucid, strangely lucid, and I am handsome like the one hundred runner, like the rutting black stallion from Mauritania. I carry in my blood a river of seeds that can fertilize all the plains of Byzantium and the hills, the austere hills. I am the lover, the locomotive with a well-oiled piston. It's a very beautiful poem. Do have a read. Lord Fraser of Corrigarth is seen waving his fist at the Extinction Rebellion band as they make their way past his house in Westminster yesterday. That was in the Times. And I went back to Greta Thunberg, how dare you, how dare you, and Kapuczynski said it is authority that provokes revolution. I don't know whether Lord Fraser represents authority. And from there I went to Iqbal in the bitter chill of winter. 
shivers his naked body, whose skill wraps the rich in royal shawls, and I noticed Lord Fraser had some rather fancy slippers. And did my article about the end is nigh was about the risks of dieback where we enter a phase of cascading system collapse. In Melbourne, Australia, they've come up with a new term, civil disobedience, which I thought was rather good. FX Pip Titan, you've been living in a dream world, a running simulation all occurring inside your mind. Look, boys, it ever strike you that the world's not real at all? It ever strike you that we have the only mind in the world and you just thinking up everything else like me here? having the only mind in the world and thinking up you people here, thinking up the war and all the houses and the ships and them in the harbour. That ever cross your mind? And then Borges, you have wakened not out of sleep but into a prior dream and that dream lies within another and so on to infinity, which is the number of grains of sand. The path that you are to take is endless and you will die before you are truly wakened. He is a tremendous writer as well. Political reflections. The advance of the Syrian army doesn't mean a clash with the Turkish forces. Russia is reaching a compromise, agree comprehensive agreement with Turkey and Damascus to halt the military operation as soon as possible. That's E.J. Malray. The main target, according to him, is reached. The U.S. forces are out of Syria. According to the Washington Post, U.S. allied Kurds have struck a deal to bring Assad's troops back into Kurdish areas, dimming the prospect of a further U.S. presence in Syria. Syrian government troops began moving toward towns near the Turkish border Sunday night under a deal struck with Syrian Kurds following a chaotic day that saw the unravelling of the U.S. mission in northern Syria. Hundreds of Islamic State family members escaped a detention camp, uh, and these were assets of Erdogan, so I think you know, he's going to be going to let them look, I've got you out of that. Um, and essentially, uh, it looks as if there's a deal now uh, that Russia's brokered it, which will take the Syrian Arab army right up to the border, or close enough, and also establish some kind of understanding uh, with the Turks. Erdogan, we're not fighting against the Kurds, we're not targeting Turkish, the Kurdish citizens. Um, we will not let a terrorist state be established in northeast Syria. It's interesting, it was only after Netanyahu and the Kurds have been an Israeli asset for many years, um, uh, it sort of lost his way that Erdogan has moved with some dispatch. According to Hervé, and I agree with him, the winner is Bashar al-Assad. It's interesting, isn't it, how Bashar is still there all these years later. As options narrow on Syria, Trump prepares to drop sanctions hammer on Turkey. He's done this before, using the U.S. military to stop the Turkish offensive on U.S. allied Kurdish fighters was never an option. Defense officials have said, and Trump asked the Pentagon on Sunday to begin a deliberate withdrawal of all U.S. troops from northern Syria. Steve Mnuchin said on Friday that Trump had authorized very powerful new sanctions targeting Turkey. The administration appeared ready to start making good on Trump's threat to obliterate Turkey's economy. Treasury is ready to go. Additional legislation may be sought. There is great consensus on this. Turkey has asked that it not be done. Stay tuned. Uh, Trump is struggling to quell harsh criticism, including from some of his staunchest Republican backers, that he gave Erdogan a green light to attack the Kurds last Sunday, which he did, when he decided to pull a small number of U.S. troops out of the border area. Trump's decision rooted in his long-stated aim to get the U.S. out of endless wars, has prompted bipartisan concerns that it opens the door to the revival of the Islamic State. The U.S. has successfully gone after Turkey with sanctions and tariffs before hitting Ankara last year to pressure authorities to return an American pastor 
on trial for terrorism charges. Steve Mnuchin, uh, the Treasury Secretary, said Trump would sign an executive order to dissuade Turkey from any further offensive military action in northeast Syria. We will, need, we will be targeting specific Turkish individuals or departments as needed. Um, and I take you back to an article in which I was interviewed with Sputnik um, at the previous time when uh, Trump was deploying sanctioned currency warfare on Turkey and weaponizing the dollar. And I said then the dollar is a weapon and at that time Trump was relishing his financial warfare strategies. So Erdogan has got to tread extremely carefully because uh, you know we never have effective uh, this uh, repertoire of sanctioned currency warfare can be, and specifically with Turkey, which has a soft underbelly, um, they've got to tread very carefully now. The Turkish era fell after Trump threatened sanctions over Syria invasion. There was a lot of friction between the US and China, and now it's a love fest. That's a good thing, said President Trump on Friday. Um, so what we've learned is this is like a phase one deal. The president will not proceed with the hike in tariffs to 30%. Um, China has agreed to make purchases of 40 to $50 billion in US agricultural goods. Um, according to the FT, China has made few concessions in this trade truce with the US, which I agree with. In fact, I think it's zero. They bought all of ag, but by God, they needed to. Uh, White House released a letter from China's President Xi to President Trump. Healthy U.S.-China relations are important for the whole world, he said. So, as I said, the pork apocalypse has spoken to a very fragile food situation in China. That's why they're speeding up soybeans and pork purchases. Um, and then I like this from Northman Trader. The problem with algos is they can't tell what's a lie. They just buy. And that speaks to something I was writing about in May this year when I said Trump is highly tuned to the markets and is in fact something of a 21st century artiste. His positive trade tweets are timed around US market hours designed to soothe, massage and finesse US asset prices, turns more negative in Chinese trading hours. I called it next level gaming. Few leaders I can recall that have appreciated the purity of the market signal and played the game at this Yehudi menu in virtuoso level. Of course, Carl Icahn has stayed real close. Trump's tweets lulled the markets, um, and he's doing that again. Interesting uh, data from M. Nicoletos odds of a trade deal between the US and China fluctuate. They tend to have a a good probability of 70% during the day. They reach peak, usually five minutes before the US markets close, to my point, and they tend to fall below 50% after the close. So this is the point. Hong Kong's protests have disrupted Yang Yang's family life. 29-year-old lives in mainland China, was inspired by the demonstrations to write a song about freedom and upload it to the internet. Um, Family censors deleted it. He complained to his family. They weren't sympathetic. How can you support Hong Kong separatists, they asked. How can you be anti-China? His mother threatened to disown him. Before Mr. Yang left on a trip to Japan in August, his father said he hoped his son would die there. Um, and saying that China is a country brimming with opinions, but the Communist Party has spent decades preparing the Chinese people for a moment like this. The stir over Hong Kong shows in dramatic fashion how successful it has been and how the world could be shaped by it. As soon as the Communist Party pushes the patriotism button, Chinese will rise up like zombies to unite against the foreign forces, be it Japan or the NBA. They don't always know why they're against those things. In fact, many Chinese like Japan and the NBA. And I was writing about the master algorithm and how Z was building an algorithmic society. And I think having his people rise up like zombies is part of that algorithmic society. Seeing how quickly the CCP can mobilize private Chinese companies to cut off dealing with foreign companies for as little as a tweet, I'm wondering 
What would Huawei do if they were the dominant 5G provider for a country and that country's leaders said the wrong thing? Twitter is actually banned in China. Daryl Morey's tweet went viral because the CCP intentionally released it with outrage onto Weibo. These massive nationalistic hurt feelings are always orchestrated by the CCP. History was made in the last few days and it feels unreal witnessing it. Congratulations Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ali on winning the Nobel Peace Prize. These photographs are from Aaron Simene and rather good they are too. I wrote obviously this weekend about it but previously on the 2nd of July 2018 uh, when I said he's a Virilian and Gladwellian figure um, and uh, said that, you know, in Matter's language and linguistics, it's tapped into a Nelson Mandela 1994 mood, and that these 90 or so days represent the most consequential arrival of an African politician on the African stage since Mandela walked out of prison, and I stand by that. Nothing to see here, just just Staley, Bill Gates, Larry Summers palling around with Jeffrey Epstein at Epstein's mansion post-conviction. That's from Felix Salmon. And I just responded, it's the sanctimony that makes me want to puke with some of these characters. Who amongst us has not flown in someone else's private jet without knowing whose jet it was? This is Bill Gates' excuse. China's economy is expected to grow below 6% next year, which is now the base case. This short interview on David Inglis' is, uh, Twitter handle. Currency markets, Euro dollar 110.17, dollar index 98.464, Japanese yen 108.25, Swiss franc 0.9977, the pound seesawing around 125.82 last, the Australian dollar. 0.6769, India rupee 70.9245, South Korean 111.8349. So you've got a rally in some of these emerging market currencies. South Korea is not really an emerging market one, but it's rallying with the renminbi. Brazilian real 411, Egyptian pound 16.29, and the rand at a three week high of 14.75. This is a three month chart of the dollar index. I still think we remain in a firm uptrend. Euro dollar, according to T Commodity, whilst we remain below 111, remains at risk of a last move lower towards 110, 107.70, he says. 23rd of September, I put out a conviction buy on Netflix at, right at that closing price, which was 270.75. Uh, gave my reasons for that. If you're interested, they're going to be reporting quarter three results this week. In the Yahoo Finance article, they're talking about what people expect from revenues and EPS. Forget all of that. Everyone is going to look at subscriber growth. That's the key. And the key to look at is international subscri subscriber growth. And I'm bullish, as I said before. Gold, 14.88 last, and uh, we're doing a bit of work down here below 1,500. Sub-Saharan Africa, South African all shares up 5.31% year to date. Dollar rand 14.75, but still in that 14.50, 15.50 range, which we've been in for a while. Egyptian pound remains firm, 16.29. EGX 30 up 9.09%. Uber is starting boat taxis in Nigeria's Lagos. Um, Lagos is one of the highest car densities in the world, with about 200 cars per kilometer which causes traffic congestion. This is a clever idea. They're also talking about uh, grocery fulfillment. They're buying a company in Chile as well, so making some positive moves. I wrote about the platform economy. There's a lot of skepticism post WeWork, but WeWork is a different business. That was a glorified Regis, uh, and a fellow with long hair who managed to con everybody. Nigerian all share minus 15.58% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange minus 13.02% year to date. Since 2016, under President John Magafuli, Tanzania has fallen 47 places in the press freedom rankings drawn up by Reporters Without Borders to 118th out of 180. And this is part of the reason that they're not reporting on the Ebola situation where it's widely believed there are three cases 
um, uh, but they are refusing to uh, 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 cooperate with the World Health Organization. Rwanda is in the process of selling shares in its national carrier, Fly Rwanda Air, to Qatar Airways, according to um, uh, the East African. And this goes back to something I was writing before. I said it places an enormous premium on nimble policy making, heavy discount on policy making that cannot read the signs. Or as Lao Tzu put it, men are born soft and supple, dead they are stiff and hard, plants are born tender and pliant, dead they are brittle and dry. Thus, whoever is stiff and inflexible is a disciple of death, whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. The hard and the stiff will be broken, the soft and supple will prevail. Kagame is soft and supple in this regard. Have a look at this footage from the governor of Nairobi, relaxing. Uh, um, uh, and doing some dance moves. The state here in Kenya is eyeing 421 billion shillings in new loans after Parliament raised the debt ceiling to 9 trillion shillings. Um, uh, this is becoming an enormous problem. Party after party. Have a look at this. This is again the governor of, of Nairobi as well. Mir says, as they say, any publicity is good publicity. The Kenya shillings at 103.18, Nairobi all shares up 5.1.13%. Year to date, NSE 20s down 13.36%. Year to date. Thank you for stopping by.